You know, I, I have to say that I've had a very long journey in both things. You know, I have a PhD from Columbia, so I, as a young woman, I've been very invested in academia and I give lectures on science and neurology. I teach psychiatric residents, so I'm very um, linked to other disciplines. But I have come um, not around, I think I've always felt this way, but even more profoundly. I think that fiction, uh, novels in particular, but other kinds of fiction, uh, can carry more of the truth of human reality than any other form. And I say that as someone who is deeply invested in forms of nonfiction, you know, who cares about science, who cares about philosophy and, and the humanities very deeply. But um, I think the most liberating, nuanced, and complex view of human experience uh, lies in great fiction. It's true, we agree. <laughs> We're, we agree about this. But I think arriving at that place, um, I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, I have arrived at that place after extensive traveling in other forms. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's not as if I'm unfamiliar. It's not as if I've adopted some arrogant position about fiction writing. I think I really understand both the strengths and the limitations of, say, any reductive science, right? Where you you go from uh, the proliferation of reality, which would be more like the novel, and you reduce it to something formulaic or to some kind of biological substratum, mm -hmm. uh, and there's always a loss, uh, you see? So yeah. the losses are often too great. Um, whereas in the realm of, you know, complex and rich fiction, uh, those losses don't exist. You know, the drama of writing fiction is also what to put in and what to leave out, right? Any narrative, uh, is a narrative because it leaves out huge parts of the story, if you will, right? There are things that are missing. So narrative knits events together, links events in some kind of chain that necessarily leaves out lots of phenomenological experience. Right, you and I sitting here. I could never, I could tell a story about our conversation tomorrow, for example. Um, and, and I would, of course, not be able to tell actually what happened. You know, I'm looking at your face. I'm noticing all kinds of aspects of your physiognomy. Uh, if I start moving, then I will see, you know, that you have a red zipper. Uh, and all of that is part of what I'm noticing right now. But when tomorrow I tell the story, your red zipper is a very small and unnecessary part. You know, what I'm interested in is the questions you asked me, um, something about the feeling of your presence that could become part of the story, but you have to choose, right? And what do we choose um, as we remember? I think we choose what's emotionally significant, often, right? Um, there's, there are aspects of any human encounter that can be forgotten because they're so routine, you know? If, um, if you or I broke the social norms and arrived naked to this interview, we would remember that, right? 
oh, but sure. <laughs> we would definitely oh my god but 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 since we're both observing the general social norms uh, we're not going to remember that so literary stories are generally about what's not routine you know something breaks up ordinary reality um, and that's what we remember and that's what we want to tell about it all becomes part of the geography of the writer and I think that there are limitations to that geography but that writing books is often exploring one aspect of um, yeah, a writer's inner landscape, if you will. And I love the fact that you use the word space because I think both memory and imagination are uh, about spatial navigation, right? We can't remember an event in our lives without putting it somewhere. It has to have an architectural uh, spot, inside or outside, you know, in the city, in the country, wherever. We remember our own childhood's events inside a space. And when you think about artificial memory systems, the, uh, you know, classical and then into the medieval and renaissance periods, it's all about walking through these rooms or spaces or a city. And I think navigating is crucial to imagination and memory. Well, I love Virginia Woolf too. She's very important to me. I wrote my dissertation on Dickens um, at Columbia uh, in part because I, was, I got really fascinated with uh, language and identity in his novels. So this has been a long-standing uh, fascination of mine, including uh, you know, what happens to people who have neurological damage, brain damage, what happens to their language, what happens to ideas of the self, um, and what does language have to do with it. So Dickens is, I loved him as a child. Um, I still love Dickens, but I love Virginia Woolf too. And she's a fascinating example of uh, the kind, you know, the novel as ph as phenomenology. Mm. I read to the lighthouse, you know, as a young person, and reread it after I had spent really years working on Maurice Merleau Ponty, the French uh, uh, philosopher. And of course, she was writing before Merleau Ponty, and I said to myself. She's a philosopher of phenomenology. I mean, she's really writing the phenomenological experience. It's, it's uncanny. Uh, so there's a, a great example of fiction uh, anticipating philosophical ideas, right? In The Blazing World, my most recent novel, uh, there's a very important figure, Margaret Cavendish, um, who was a natural philosopher, writer. She wrote plays, uh, philosophy, uh, science. I mean, she was a remarkable uh, figure who has become more and more important in philosophy departments, especially in Anglo-American philosophy departments. Um, but she, of course, was not ignored uh, during the time that she was writing. She was um, a duchess, the Duchess of Newcastle. So she had uh, status mm -hmm. in, the, in the society. But her ideas were uh, often ignored and made fun of. So in that book, she's a, a central figure. I think um, in terms of 17th century philosophy, she's a an original and brilliant thinker. She was, in fact, a genius. Mm -hmm. But she suffered the fate of many uh, women geniuses in the history of the West, mm -hmm. which is that their ideas are either hidden mm -hmm. um, 
ignored or made fun of. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Virginia Woolf is a towering figure in literature. I mean, there's no question that she reached that place. Um, there are, I think, any number of other uh, figures who have not gotten their literary due or their philosophical due or their scientific due simply because they're women. You know what, I've decided that um, actually waiting for me at home, my publisher is um, reset my first novel, The Blindfold, which was published in 1992. And so um, I have to do the proofs for this reset edition, right? And uh, I thought, oh, I have to read this book again. And then I realized, well, it's rather, I know I wrote it, but it's rather like reading um, a novel that was written by someone else. So that I am against interfering with one's own former self. You know, I, I'm not going to change sentences if I think something is, could be better now. Uh, because I think then you, you, you end up betraying that earlier version of yourself. Henry James did this with what he called the New York edition. He kind of went back and rewrote himself. And I think it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So I'm not going there. I mean, I'm happy to talk about my <laughs> earlier work, but I, I'm not going to change it at this late day. Oh yes, thank God that people change, right? I mean, thank God that I have, I happen to, so far, um, for another reason, I had to reread my second novel. And it was so, now, you know, it's quite far removed in terms of years. But I really liked it. I thought, oh good, you know, I, I, I can live with this, this is fine. But there's no question that it's not what I would write now. I wouldn't, even though there are certain themes, certain um, uh, obsessions that return in my work that I can recognize, I um, wouldn't rewrite myself. But that I've changed as a writer, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I confess that I, I, I really read a lot, so I read in my ordinary daily routine life about four hours a day. So I write for six to seven, and then in the afternoons, I get up very early and, and write, and then I read. Because reading, uh, it, it, it is less active than writing, obviously. So when my brain wears down from writing, I read. And I read lots of, lots of different things. I'm trying to think, um, I could tell you one thing close to my bed at home is actually the Museum of Modern Arts um, catalog of Louise Bourgeois. Uh, they have a, there's a, a new show at MoMA right now and I'm going to actually do a panel about that show with Juliet Mitchell, who's a psychoanalyst, and Deborah Wai, who is the curator of the 1982 Louise Bourgeois show in, um, uh, in New York, and is now the curator of this new show. So she, they, she knew Louise Bourgeois, I did not, but I've written about her a couple of times. So Louise Bourgeois is a, close to my bed at home right now, and Yes, I can tell you another thing. Um, someone I do know, uh, a neuroscientist, Antonio Damasio, mm -hmm. he, I just got the proofs of his new book, which I, he had, were friends, so he had sent me some chapters that I read before, but I've started reading that, so that's another book. Um, let me think of a third. Now, I'm working on a novel now, and when I'm writing a novel, I have a tendency not to read fiction. That's what I want to ask. And I'll tell you why. It, I have, at different times, um, 
read, um, you know, actually, if you, obviously, if you read bad fiction, it doesn't make any difference. But if you read a strong voice, okay. it can, it's contagious. And, you know, you find your sentences, you know, having the, you know, getting this overt influence, and you don't want that. What you want is your influences to be so fully digested, so um, deeply inside and part of the, the general music of what you're doing that you can't notice them. Of course, they're there. Every writer is, um, comes from the voices of beloved other writers. You How could it not be, right? Yeah. You, you have to be very careful because the good one can change you. Yes, and I think what you want is <laughs> those changes to be old, not new, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when they're just completely unconscious, it no longer matters because you own them, mm. right? But if you say, I mean, I can think of, you know, Virginia Woolf is a great example of a powerful voice, a powerful rhythmic voice in English. Um, Dickens is another very different example of a powerful prose voice. In a different way altogether, someone like Henry James has been very important for me another prose voice that's very seductive, mm -hmm. you know, very winding, and especially in the late books, mm -hmm. um, that can have a, a contagious mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. So yes, I avoid that while I'm writing fiction. But then I read fiction after, you know, when I'm done with the novel. I read a lot of fiction. I, I find that there are moments in, in books, usually when you're well into the novel, where it's almost as if the organism of the novel begins to take over. You know, there's a kind of inevitability, I think, if you've set it up correctly. And then uh, you, as a writer, kind of follow along. It's odd, right? But. And of course, the unconscious does a lot. <laughs> I mean, editing sentences is always a conscious act. You know, I, there's something wrong with this sentence. I fix this. You know, the music of it is off or the rhythms are off. But the story itself is manufactured in unconscious ways, I think, that are surprising, for me, often surprising. But writing novels is, I think, um, a very daily uh, activity, so you need continuity. For me, I need to get up every morning, get to my desk, uh, put in my hours. There are good days and bad days. Um, but I'm not so distracted, even though everything you say about the city is true. New York is... An, overwhelmingly stimulating city. Uh, it's strikingly diverse. People from all over the world live there. 40% uh, of the city is foreign born. Think of that. You get on the subway, you hear many languages spoken. You know, it's a, it's an exciting city. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I never feel that the city is, you know, competing with the book. Maybe I'm too old, <laughs> I don't know, but um, I don't feel that. But I do love walking in the streets of New York. I live in Brooklyn, and there's a lot going on even when you go and buy your groceries. And I think that's a form of nurturance. You know, I like the fact that um, when I leave my desk and walk into the street, there is a complex, uh, interesting, very much alive reality just beyond my door. It's comforting in a way. <laughs>